Research Institute for Metabolism and Diabetes uh, to you guys. Uh, we're a new institute. Uh, Florida Hospital established it five years ago, and this building on the corner of Princeton and Orange uh, has only been there for three years now, so we're a very young research institute. Uh, we sit in the middle between actually Florida Hospital uh, and the Diabetes Institute and uh, Lake uh, San Burnham out in Lake Nona. And the goal of our institute is to cure diabetes, type 1 and both type, two, uh, type 1 and type 2. And our collaborations with Sanford Burnham allows us to take discoveries that they make in animal models, cell culture models, things that we can't do in humans. We can uh, then, uh, in, in our institute, apply some of those uh, techniques and things into humans and validate the research. And uh, vice versa, we can take discoveries or uh, treatments that are going on in the hospital and we can work backwards to uh, doing that in the mouse because there are some things that we can do in mice that we can't do in the, the people uh, for, for ethical reasons. Um, so, so that's kind of how our relationship works. And so I'm gonna um, talk to you a little bit about my career path and how I ended up here in, in Florida. So the game plan for my talk, um, I'm an exercise physiologist by training. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you, uh, and I study skeletal muscle, so I'm gonna, most of the, everything that I talk to you about is gonna be about skeletal muscle and exercise. And it's gonna be kind of segmented into three general categories, um, athletics and rehabilitation, aging and metabolism. And the idea is to take you from the field uh, to the lab, and then to the lab to the clinic, and highlight my path from, from the west coast to the east coast, which spans five states. I'm originally from California, and I've uh, been jumping around uh, for the last eight years. So the field. So I did my undergraduate degree at San Jose State University. Um, I'm a certified athletic trainer and strength and conditioning specialist. So uh, what, uh, what that means is uh, when you see somebody get hit, for example, on the football field, and you need uh, and, and they get hurt, the individuals that run out, some of those individuals are athletic trainers. And so when I started my degree, I was interested in uh, basically rehabilitation of athletes, because I was, I was an athlete in high school, not good enough to be an athlete in college. Uh, so to stay close to athletics, um, I was interested in uh, being able to uh, help rehab uh, the picture down here athletes when they, get, when they get injured. And so during this time, I was lucky enough, I, I worked uh, at a physical therapy clinic, uh, a local high school as an athletic trainer, and I even um, was able to intern for the Oakland Raiders um, for their training camp uh, for two years. And so on this, uh, at this time in my career, I was really interested in, in pursuing athletic training, and in order and to be an athletic trainer for, say, a professional team or a big-time college. In order to do that, you had to have your master's degree to, uh, to work uh, in, in that level. So um, I applied to one of 13 schools at the time that were accredited uh, to uh, have a, a master's degree in athletic training. And this led me to flee uh, sunny California to the cold Midwest, uh, to Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. Uh, and this is where um, I got my first taste of research because we had to do a master's uh, thesis uh, to, gra to graduate from the program. Uh, I worked at a local high school. Um, I was an athletic trainer for uh, 350 student athletes uh, by, by my lonesome. Um, and this is where I started asking questions about how can I help, how can I help the students, uh, student athletes uh, perform better, recover better, um, and so I got interested in muscle soreness. So we all know you go to the gym, and the next day you're just you just wake you can barely get out of bed and wake up. So so I thought to myself, I'm asked the question, how can I help relieve that soreness? So if you're not so sore the next day, then you can continue to work out and and, and keep and keep going. So the title of my master's thesis was um, the effects of high-dose fish oil supplementation on delayed onset muscle soreness and inflammatory markers. So what I did is I wrote a small grant to GlaxoSmithKline because at the time they had a prescription fish oil. And so we all know that fish oil has anti-inflammatory properties. And so I thought that if you consume this fish oil uh, and you had a hard workout, the soreness that you would uh, feel would be 
in attenuated. And so the reason why we went to the pharmaceutical uh, compound is because when you go buy fish oil at GNC or in the store, maybe out of 1,000 milligrams, 50 milligrams are the actual ingredients you want to be consuming, whereas the prescription dose is almost 99% what you want to consume. And so what we did, uh, what I did, is I gave all of my, my classmates uh, 60 days worth of fish oil, and we uh, induced soreness on them using this machine here. So this is a, a Biodex. Um, I have a video to show you uh, how it works, but essentially the students would sit in this position, and uh, this, there's an arm behind the guy's leg that's attached to the machine, and basically the machine is going to force their leg down, and they have to resist against it. So I have uh, a video just to kind of just to show you what that looks like. You have to unmute the volume too if you want volume. So this is the arm and it's attached to his knee. And so the machine is, is going to be, right now he's, he's contracting with the machine and then the machine pushes down and he has to resist that motion uh, through. Uh, uh, so they're going to lose against the machine because the machine is going to push them. And we, uh, my friends, oh, yeah. My friends, my friends didn't like me very much because the average number of contractions they had to do was 300. So they had to do, they had to do, go through a certain uh, protocol, and when when we determined that they were sufficiently fatigued, uh, we did not have to stop, which which resulted in 300. Uh, the average was 300 contractions. Um, so. So ultimately, we, uh, the results from this, uh, we didn't find any, any significant effect of the, of the fish oil. We measured some inflammatory markers in the blood. Uh, and Mute the volume. Mute the screen. You have another video playing. Yeah. Sorry. That happens to us all the time. Yes. Yeah. So we measured some inflammatory markers in the blood, and we didn't see anything. Uh, so it was kind of disappointing, but uh, at the same time, it was it was my first case of research, and and then I thought to myself, well, I can I can finish my master's, go back to be an athletic trainer, or, or I can maybe investigate some of these findings that I've uh, found a little bit further. So I thought to myself, well, I just measured uh, inflammatory markers in the blood, but I'm trying to to answer a question about muscle soreness. So what's actually happening in the muscle? So uh, the lab, the school and the, and the lab didn't have access to, to uh, investigate muscle specifically. So this led me then to uh, do my PhD, to get more experience in, in a lab that actually gets access to uh, skeletal muscle. And so um, this uh, brings me to where I did my PhD um, at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. And uh, they specifically study skeletal muscle in the context of aging and exercise. So uh, this is an MRI image of a cross-section of the thigh. So you're looking at, this is the femur, this is the, ham the hamstrings, and the quad. And uh, we do muscle biopsies, so we can take a piece of muscle from uh, the participants and we can, uh, you see it here, and we can then study that muscle in relation to the context of, of what we want to do. And we can get down all the way to one individual muscle fiber uh, that's attached here to a force transducer. And we can also determine uh, what type of muscle fiber it is and what properties it has. Um, so, ranges from slow oxidative, which what you would expect a marathon runner to have, very good at endurance. And then you have fibers that are fast and glycolytic, which are mainly related to power weightlifting type exercises. Um, so I wanted to show a video. Um, this is a video for, taken from BBC. It's called the Making of Knee Series. Uh, it was conducted at Ball State University on Colin Jackson, who is a 
Uh, he was, uh, I think he still holds one record in the hurdles, but he's an Olympic gold medalist. They did a biopsy on him and talked generally, and I will talk generally about the, the processes and, and the performance of, of, uh, of his abilities and what we, what we can do with, with taking a, a muscle biopsy from a person and what kind of information we get. Colin Jackson is about to take a journey of self-discovery. What I'm hoping to get is some bit of truth. 20 gold medals. Winner of two world records. One of the fastest men on the planet. But despite all of this, he still has one burning question. Am I really any good? Or did I just really... Really, really work hard. Could some of us be born sporty? I would say, well, I've just chose my parents well, right? Or is athletic success down to upbringing, sheer hard work, and dogged determination? Colin believes he was born special. <laughs> but for the first time in his life, yeah, so you the scientists put it in the actual muscle biopsy procedure. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if Colin's talent wasn't immediately evident, how did he get his perfect body? One that accelerated as fast as a sports car. And the hurdles a metre high. With just five millimetres to spare. And all in under 13 seconds. Can science provide the answers? Colin's travelling into the American Midwest. He's heading for a unique high-tech research facility where scientists are going to do something amazing. Something Collins avoided for his entire racing career. By cutting out a chunk of his leg muscles, they hope to be able to tell him why he was so fast. I'm in India and I'm on my way to Ball State University to get a biopsy done. So, uh, slightly anxious about that, but it gives me the real opportunity to see what I was born with. Go through all these tests now and answer the physical questions um, for me personally, so I can see exactly, no doubt about it, I was born to be a leader. You need it. Judgment Day arrives. <laughs> Professor Scott Trappy is a world leading expert in human performance. So, this is where we test aerobic capacity. Professor Trappy can actually look right inside the inner workings of our muscles. We have a human muscle sample. Okay, there's probably a couple thousand muscle fibers. Amazingly, he can not only tell whether we've inherited muscles that are extra fast, but also which sports they're best suited to. Muscles are made up of different kinds of fibers. These darker fibers here are what are considered slow twitch muscle fibers, and they're best suited for endurance based activities. <coughs> so, okay. These uh, lighter bleached out ones are fast twitch fibers, they're for ballistic power type movements. Okay. Most people have a mixture. So, slow twitch fibers are good for endurance sports like marathons. Fast twitch fibers are good for sports that need bursts of power, like hurling. Well, what I want to find out is how much I form with the fast twitch instead of those lighter ones yes. than the slow twitch. What we'd like to do is get a sample like that from you so we can assess what qualities your muscle had to make you a champion. Are you, are you interested? Are you up for it? Mm -hmm. so you can get from a cheap run. Well, we prefer your leg muscles. Exodus. <laughs> 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 Professor Trappy is going to test his muscles. Well, obviously, you're going to be a little bit tense because they're going to be ripping muscles and fibers from the outside. You know. So, yeah, of course, I'm a little bit anxious. As an athlete, no way you have done this. Yeah, that's great. Head back up here and you can just lay down on the 
feel a little bit of the stick here. I think I am glad I've gone through it all. Um, I'd be happy if I got an advantage, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> it would be a nice feeling to say, you see, I'm kind of superhuman, right? <laughs> but if they say, oh, well, you just worked hard and you were lucky and you were just like a guy off the street, I'd be slightly disappointed, I must have been. Weeks ago, scientists took slices of muscle from his thigh. Now the test results have arrived. Okay, there you go. Last set of the results. These are the biopsy results, right? And no peaking. Oh. <laughs> okay. The scientists have analyzed muscle fibers from Colin's leg. Some fibers are fast twitch, some are slow twitch. Colin's about to find out whether he had extra fast fibers or whether he was just like any other man on the street. Most people have about 50% slow twitch and 50% fast twitch. Three quarters, 75% of my muscle were fast twitch. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so you are very, very suited for power sports. However, the most significant finding was the amount of super fast twitch fiber type that we observed in your muscle sample. These are very rare. Okay. So we have seen no more than 2% of them in any athlete that they've tested. But in me, <laughs> there is 25% wow. of your fibers with this super fast twitch type. So I've got these super, super. I like that word, super fast. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Super fast, is it? Yeah. It's a surprise. <laughs> well, how are you looking back now? I don't use it. Alright, so he, uh, yeah. so, so, so our fiber type uh, is in part genetically determined. Uh, you can thank your parents for what you have. But the majority of us are 50%. Um, and so in Colin's case, he has a lot more of these super fast, which are the two X fibers, uh, than any, uh, anybody else. I think he, he's the only other athlete that's really good athlete that's been tested. Uh, it would be nice if more athletes would come forward to allow us to test them, just so we can get a sense of, you know, of what their muscle is like. Um, to compare it to him, because since he's more fast like Liddick, back in the 60s, Frank Shorter, American uh, mm -hmm. marathon runner, got tested by the lab. He has 50% type 1s, mm -hmm. so he's on the slow. this mm -hmm. slow side. So he is genetically determined to be uh, you know, a little bit better at running uh, long distances rather than That's short distances. Problem. What's that? We know uh, it's uh, you know, it's you can sore for a couple days, but otherwise it's okay. No stitches. Back. He could go yeah. run and do his thing, and yeah. just as super fast. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're only taking out about a pea size chunk of muscle. I've you know had seven pea, so I've gone and I mean I've had the muscle biopsy done, and then 30 <coughs> minutes later go run four miles, five miles. It's okay. And you just your own guinea pig. No, I mean, we, I participate, I participate in a lot of other students' research, research uh, projects. Uh, we are always the young, healthy controls, so, yes. Is this predictive? Would you be taking a 
taking samples of young boys and figuring out? Yeah, it, it, that's, yeah, it's, there's some ethical, uh, ethical yeah, reasons <laughs> to, to do that. There is uh, some people interested in, you know, basically determining which genes are, for example, or just from just like a swab of your mouth to figure out what sport your kid would be good at, and then you basically funnel him to, I mean, in a, in a way, uh, parents are already indirectly doing that. I'm sure Colin, you know, he was always probably a fast kid, so you always, you know, self-select where you're going to go. Um, but, yeah, there are some people interested in, in determining that. So I'm going to spend the ne uh, next little bit talking about some of the, my dissertation, some of the research I did here uh, at Ball State. <coughs> Um, so just some background, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug consumption, some stats for you. In the U.S., this is old now, and I'm sure it might be more. Americans spend $2.5 billion on over-the-counter pain relievers per year. The top two are ibuprofen and acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. And we know, uh, I don't know if you know, back in the 90s, uh, some COX-2 inhibitors, uh, Celebrex and Biox were on the market and they were taken off because they caused people to have heart attacks and, and strokes. And so um, we were interested in uh, COX-2 is an enzyme that's in the heart, but it's also in the muscle, kill the muscle. And so we uh, wanted to know what happens if you take these uh, Cox inhibitors, and what happens to skeletal muscle. And so without going into too much detail, uh, when you exercise, um, young, men, they took young men and women and they resistance trained them. And then after the training, they took ibuprofen or acetaminophen, and you see a blunted response uh, in your protein synthesis, so building a new muscle. So this is considered to be a negative finding when you, when you lift and you uh, you exercise, you want to build muscle, build lean body mass, but if you take these drugs, you inhibit that response. And so, the, so this is generally how it works uh, in skeletal muscle. When you exercise, you have your cell membrane that are composed of possible lipids. Uh, without going into too much details, uh, you get converted by enzyme, possible lipids get converted to arachidonic acid. Uh, it then, the arachidonic acid reaches the COX enzyme which forms prostaglandin, and there's a, this is a precursor. There's several prostaglandins that can be produced, uh, but for the sake of, of uh, the talk, we're going to talk. I'm going to talk to you about PGE2 and PGF2 alpha, and these are important to skeletal muscle because when they get made, they get released uh, out of the cell, and then uh, combine with receptors where PGE2 can induce muscle atrophy, and on the flip side of that, PGF stimulates muscle growth. So the hypothesis was that if you take COX inhibitors, that you're going to block uh, this enzyme from producing both PGE2 and PGF, and then you're going to have detrimental effect, effects of muscle atrophy and muscle growth. And so then just to remind you that after an acute resistance exercise bout, if you consume COX inhibitors, you reduce PGC, uh, PGF and you reduce uh, muscle growth. And so. Uh, moving forward with this research, this was already done when I joined the lab, uh, but we had the question, the most common group of people that consume uh, and the COX inhibitors are older people. Uh, and older people also lose muscle as they get older, and so if you combine the two, then that's likely going to be detrimental to an older person. They're going to uh, have an accelerated a loss of muscle. So we wanted to test that. So we recruited some 60-year-old, uh, 60 to 70-year-old uh, men and women, and we put them into a resistance training program. So simply just three sets of 10 of knee extension, so sitting on the weight stack and just knee extension. And they did this uh, three days a week for three months. And there were three groups. One group received a sugar pill. The other group received the maximal over-the-counter dose of acetaminophen, which is 4,000 milligrams, and the maximal over-the-counter dose of ibuprofen, which is 1,200 milligrams. And what we tested them, uh, the main outcomes were muscle size, which we determined by the MRI, which I, I showed you a picture of the cross-section of the muscle, and the muscle strength, and we also took a muscle biopsy from each of these subjects. So, we were hypothesizing that the 
consumption of these drugs would be bad. Uh, <coughs> you would not see the training effects that you normally see in people that consume just the sugar pill. So this is the data. Uh, so this is just broad muscle size. <coughs> who consume the sugar pill uh, increase their muscle size by 9%, which is typical adaptation for this type of exercise regime. And, and interestingly, the people who consume the drugs actually increase more uh, muscle mass than uh, the placebo group. And we were thinking to ourselves, well, is this really functional muscle? They grew more, okay, but does this relate to functional uh, improvements? And we do see that the people had uh, not only had more muscle, they also had uh, greater uh, muscle strength. So it was indeed functional muscle uh, that, they, that they grew. And so we found that the drugs stimulate a 25 to 50% increase in muscle mass and strength. And if you consider sarcopenia, which is an uh, age-related loss of muscle, the placebo group with just uh, res uh, reverse seven years of this sarcopenia, and the drug groups re reverse 10. So we were confused by these, <coughs> because these went against our hypothesis. We didn't know, we weren't expecting this, we were expecting the drugs to be bad. So it was uh, my task to figure out why this occurred in the muscle, so taking the muscle body samples and, and analyzing. So I chose 21 different components associated with muscle growth. Um, and seven enzymes, two receptors, three growth receptors, four atrophy, and five inflammatory regulators. And without going through all of this, I'm going to focus on the three major components that were regulated differently between the, sugar, the, the placebo sugar pill group and the, the drug groups. So for the first uh, proposed mechanism that we hypothesized that this is occurring, if you remember, PGF is the uh, molecule that stimulates muscle growth. Well, its receptor that sits in the membrane actually increased in both of the groups compared to the placebo. And so uh, bringing back this picture for you, so this is what we hypothesized when you take the COX inhibitors to happen. Well, the adaptation we saw was that you actually add more of these receptors. So you have a higher probability of this low, it's lowly produced, you have a higher probability of this binding and having its effect. So we only block some of it. And the muscle responds by adding more of the receptor to stimulate, to get that stimulus back. So that is the first proposed mechanism. The second is we measured some inflammatory and, and proteolytic or uh, uh, genes that are related to muscle loss. And so we see a big increase in the placebo group. Uh, and this is blunted when you are consuming the drugs. And uh, IL-6 uh, stimulates net muscle skeletal muscle loss uh, in humans. The next one is uh, a gene called MERC-1. Uh, it's high in the placebo group. And we see this blunted in the acetaminophen and ibuprofen group. And MERC-1 is a ligase that's associated with breaking down of skeletal muscle. So to bring back the, so um, at this time, we had some, we didn't have any evidence of, of a connection between prostaglandins and these two markers. So we looked into the literature and found in non-skeletal muscle tissue that uh, these, uh, that prostaglandin E can actually stimulate IL-6 and MRF production. So we proposed that it's through an attack B, um, and that uh, when the PGE binds to its receptor, it stimulates IL-6 and MRF. And when you consume the drugs, uh, the drugs reduce the amount of PGE you have, which ultimately reduces its effects downstream. However, we didn't know if this occurs in human muscle. So we had to devise a way to, uh, to investigate this. So we performed an ex vivo study. So uh, in vivo, um, inside, your, inside the person, ex vivo, taken out of the person in a test tube. Uh, so that, that's all the, the difference there. So we developed a method to, to do this. Um, it's, not, it's not a new method. It's been done in the 70s, 60s and 70s, but we didn't have this uh, capability in our lab. So I'm going to kind of show you um, 
this, these experiments. So what we have here is the oxygen tank, and it's connected to a water bath, and the water bath uh, has these little tubes attached to it, and here's a close-up view. So um, the muscle is, this is an eraser actually, um, to, to do some of the testing to establish the method, sits inside, the muscle sits inside this little tube. It's a very scientifically a precise Velcro placement uh, on, on the tube to uh, keep the tube attached to this uh, water bath, which actually shakes like this. And there's and water is up, up to the tube, it's 37 degrees, so we can keep the, the temperature inside the tube, body our body temperature. And oxygen then flows through this uh, little apparatus into the, into the tube um, to supply the oxygen that the muscle needs during our experiments. And so what this study looks like is we take the piece of muscle from the biopsy, we uh, put uh, the muscle inside these tubes, uh, we have uh, two tubes that don't receive prostaglandin and two tubes that do receive prostaglandin. Uh, we incubate them for one to two hours and then measure if IL-6 and MRF are actually activated. The test to see if prostaglandin E actually does uh, stimulate these genes to be produced. And so what we found is that both IL-6 and MRF are upregulated when in the presence of prostaglandin E2. So we confirmed uh, that our hypothesis was right, that PG2 simulates this, and if you block PGE with the COX inhibitors, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, uh, you reduce the negative effects of these two genes on muscle growth. So to summarize, um, we found that uh, through the PGE2 receptor, that uh, PGE2 stimulates IL-6 and MRF, and so that leads to muscle atrophy, and if you take COX inhibitors, you uh, blunt that response. So just to summarize everything, the, the drugs improved these individuals' muscle size and, and strength through the stimulation of PGF uh, and the reduction of IL-6 and MRF. So collectively, the drugs, taking the drugs every day, uh, promoted a muscle environment that promoted protein synthesis or growth of the muscle, and also reduced uh, protein breakdown. And so, uh, after doing all of this, this research, um, uh, it was a, the, the, this PhD program is very fast, it's three years. Uh, so I felt uh, that I didn't have too much research experience, it's very accelerated. So we have what we call postdoctoral training um, so uh, that, and that's where I am now in, in, uh, in my career, where uh, I spend three to four years with somebody and basically just get more research experience before I venture out on my own. And so after leaving, I left Ball State and went to um, the University of Pittsburgh to investigate muscle and, and how metabolism, uh, in muscle and exercise influence metabolism, some of the same pathways that I studied Ball State, uh, where the similar pathways that are also affected by metabolism were also under an obesity epidemic, uh, type 2 diabetes epidemic. Uh, so I was interested in, in understanding metabolism and how exercise will help influence uh, uh, people's diseases. And so I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I stayed there for one year. And my boss said, OK, well, we're going to move down to Florida. Do you want to go? I said, yes, thank goodness, get me out of the snow. Yeah. Um, uh, so I moved, moved down here, and I'm going to just real, wrap up real quick and talk to you about some of this uh, research that I'm involved with here in Orlando. So uh, we study uh, pretty heavily peripheral insulin resistance. So what I mean by that is uh, we consider the skeletal muscle to be in the periphery uh, instead of the central system. And so we're under, trying to understand why muscle becomes insulin resistant. So if you take uh, an individual that is uh, fairly lean and you tell him to not do anything and to eat a lot, he eventually uh, will become obese. And when you become obese, eventually you can develop type 2 diabetes. And ultimately, you develop peripheral insulin resistance. And uh, the hallmark of 
peripheral insulin resistance is impaired glucose uptake and altered fatty acid metabolism oxidative stress. Now, this is a little bit of the chicken or the egg. Um, we don't know if changes in these pre precede changes here, actually developing insulin resistance, or if uh, insulin resistance uh, is, uh, causes these. And so it's kind of the chicken and the egg argument uh, that we are trying to understand a little bit further. So the main clinical study that uh, I, I work on is funded by the NIH. Um, it's called MIRAGE, but the acronym stands for Scaled Muscle Lipid and Insulin Resistance and Aging. Um, and so we recruit uh, 65 to 70 year olds. And this is just a schematic of what the study looks like. So we, we take uh, these older individuals and perform a VFMAX test, a cardiorespiratory fitness. So in the video, you saw the guy running on the treadmill. So uh, because these are older individuals, we typically use a bike just because uh, it's safer for, for them. So essentially, they get uh, put on a bike. They get a mask that they breathe in and out of. We capture their uh, CO2 and oxygen levels. And we can determine how much oxygen their body consumes to perform uh, the particular exercise. And they go until they can't go anymore. So this is maximal effort. Uh, they're trying their hardest to, to pedal and, and, and keep, keep going. So we test their aerobic, aerobic capacity. Um, before we, we start the study, we also do a, a DEXA. So um, this is a, a DEXA machine where the person will lay down here and this little arm will uh, come or start at the head and, and follow down. And this gives us body composition measurements. So um, this test is, is not very uh, forgiving. I've had many of these and it's always disappointing when I get the results back because it tells you total fat, um, the total fat percentage, it also gives you the total lean mass, the total bone mass, and fat-free mass. So it allows us to basically uh, understand what's happening to the person's body composition when we put them through any type of regime exercise or anything like that. Uh, what happens to their, their body uh, mass and, and muscle when um, the whole body uh, in response to the intervention. And then uh, lastly, so they get a muscle uh, MRI, which I showed you already, and then lastly they come in and get a hyperinsulinic euglycemic clamp and two muscle biopsies. So this is a schematic explaining the clamp. So hyperinsulinic, meaning uh, uh, high levels of insulin, and euglycemic, meaning blood glucose is staying the same. So what we do is the individual is just lying in the bed, doesn't have to do anything. Uh, we take the, we put ID in, take their blood every five minutes, very small amount, and we measure their blood glucose. So then we start uh, the insulin injection. It's hyperinsulinic, it's higher uh, the insulin levels than what you have normally uh, right now sitting here. And uh, so that insulin is going for four hours and it's going to stimulate your body to uptake your glucose, your blood glucose. That's what insulin, part of what insulin does. Uh, but then we also, uh, add uh, glucose infusion. So we infuse glucose into these people at the same time. And the goal is, is that we keep, we increase the glucose uh, infusion as the insulin stimulates their, that effect. So we keep their blood glucose normal, and uh, basically the higher the amount of blood glu of glucose we need to put in their blood means that they're more insulin sensitive. So for example, an athlete will have to pump a lot of blood, or a lot of uh, glucose into their blood because they're body is able to uptake it, whereas a, a type 2 diabetic, for example, um, who is insulin resistant, it's, um, they don't need as much uh, glucose because they don't respond to the, to the insulin. And so they do that, and then uh, we enter them into a six-month intervention. So you get education, people with the, uh, just get education control, they serve as the control group. Next, we get uh, people, uh, they meet with a dietitian and they get diet induced weight loss. So, the goal is to lose 10% of their initial weight when they come in um, through just nutritional uh, counseling. And then uh, the third group gets the nutritional counseling plus an exercise program. And then we do all the same measurements again at the end. 
And so uh, this is some data that we have uh, comparing uh, weight loss only and weight loss combined with exercise. Um, so, so this is a percent change. So you see about a 10% reduction in body weight in both groups. Um, but you see a greater loss of fat mass uh, in the exercise group. And you see a, a reduction in uh, the loss of fat-free mass. So when you lose weight, you're going to lose fat, but you're also going to lose muscle. Uh, you don't want to lose muscle. And so the exercise is able to prevent that effect. And um, some of the subjects that have completed, we've done 23 out of 140 that we hope to get. Um, this is their uh, insulin change in their insulin sensitivity. So this is glucose infusion rate, how much glucose we needed to add uh, to, their, uh, to the plant. And the control group, you see not too much change, which we would hope that they were good controls. The diet induced weight loss uh, shows uh, an, an increase and then uh, you see even a greater increase when you add exercise on top of that. And so the goal of this investigation is to understand how exercise on top of the weight loss uh, helps the muscle become more insulin sensitive so we can start teasing out some of those, uh, from the first uh, slide I showed you, some of those intricacies of the chicken and the egg argument. And so just some last uh, statements, just kind of what maybe you guys, what I think, uh, is important for, I guess, being a scientist and what I've learned uh, to maybe take home to some of the students is uh, we rely on questions. We ask <coughs> questions about what we, uh, what we see, what we uh, read about, and what we know about physiology. Um, so uh, questions are important, but uh, also questions and a hypothesis. So we, so we want to ultimately be able to test uh, the question that we're asking. So um, that uh, my mentor students, I, I try to, uh, you know, ask them, okay, come up with a question on a topic, and then how are you going to go about testing it? Um, just to, to, to put them one step further into the, to thinking about how to solve a problem. Um, the second part is uh, finding the answers. So when it comes for, for us, uh, for me, PubMed is the, uh, is the main uh, resource I use for research. Uh, however, I don't know if, if you guys know about Google Scholar, um, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, when you go to Google, it says Gmail images, and then there's a box. You click on it, and you have the options. Well, you click more, and then you have to click even more. Buried in that list, there's Google Scholar, and I like this because uh, Google's algorithm is friendly, so you can ask like, uh, what is AT? You can ask the question, a full length question, and it'll give you research studies that are related to that question. So it's a little bit more specific, or uh, not specific, uh, gives you uh, a good jumping off point, instead of going to PubMed and you just get a lot of stuff that you're not gonna understand. Uh, so I, I really like uh, Google Scholar. Um, and, and of course, uh, creating your own solution. Like for example, I had to come up with a, a method completely, you know, I had to create the method, recreate the method uh, from papers that are from 1960 um, and acquire the skills so you can answer these questions. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about skeletal muscle, so I sought out the people that knew and applied and, and you know, went and essentially asked them if I can learn uh, these things. And that we, uh, as scientists, are building a building. So we rely on the people before us to, that laid the foundation and we continue to, to build upon that. So a, a lot of the ideas that we have generally come from something that happened in the 60s, 70s, and we uh, just say, oh, wait a minute, we have the technology now that we can do this. Or, or vice versa, uh, you know, we, we didn't know about this, uh, and so we can we can build upon it. Um, and I like uh, I like this one. My last point: creating opportunities. So uh, this book was given to me by one of my uh, undergrad mentors. It's called Who Moved My Cheese. Uh, it's a pretty pretty nice book about two, uh, a group of mice. But basically, um, I left California um, just to go to Michigan. Um, and so, and if I didn't do that, I definitely wouldn't be standing here talking to you guys. So, 
Um, to a degree, there's you know, opportunities uh, that are given to you, but there's also, by taking risks and, and, and trying to do something different, you create your own uh, opportunities that way. And so, I know I kind of went over um, the time, but I, I'll take any questions or if you want to interact with me um, after. Um, yeah.